Hello, and welcome to module 5.8. In this module, we're going to look at I and Q channels and non-coherent integration. And this brings us close to the end of the high sensitivity module, module 5. And we really start to see how assisted GPS receivers can generate very high sensitivity and work with very weak signals indeed. So the context of this, as we saw uh, in the previous video, is we, we have uh, the satellite in space generating the signal sent down to Earth. And in the previous video, we looked at coherent integration going on here, where we multiply the received signal by a copy of itself. And then we integrated for as long as we could. And the thing to remember from the previous video is we showed how there are limits to coherent integration that you really cannot go for much longer than a few tens of milliseconds before the coherent integration starts to hurt you because the phase of the signal changes and the little correlation peak that starts to grow will start to shrink and even turn in the opposite direction. And so you won't get that correlation peak you're hoping for if you integrate too long coherently. So what do we do about it? Well, that's what we're going to find out in this video. So, so there's a, a graphical representation of what I just described, is that you would hope that when you do coherent integration, after a millisecond, you would have a little correlation peak. After another millisecond, another one, and another millisecond, another one. You add them up, they all get bigger. But it doesn't actually happen like that. What, what we find, uh, as we've seen before, is there's always some residual frequency error after the down converters. And so there's this slowly changing phase on the signal as a result of the residual frequency error. And so the correlation peaks actually look like this. You have one positive, then one almost zero, and then one negative. And so as you integrate coherently, you'll add these up, and the negative one will cancel the positive one. And after three milliseconds of that kind of integration, you'd have nothing rather than something three times bigger than, than what you started with. So you, you can see you actually things get worse with longer coherent integration. And so that's just a summary of what we did uh, in the last video. So that is why we have the concept of in-phase and quadrature channels. Now, you'll remember we saw this before in Module 4, where we did all the algebra. And we'll come back to that in the next slide. Uh, but let's just draw it out in the block diagrams. So uh, on, on the simple block diagram that we started with, we've, we've got the, the front end there, and then we've got correlator and coherent integration. And in our more complicated block diagram that, that more correctly represents what goes on inside a high sensitivity receiver, all those pieces are there. There's the front end, there's the correlator, and there's coherent integration up to there. So this piece that I'm circling there corresponds to that picture over there. But we're showing the quadrature channels as well. And remember, a quadrature channel was simply one where we're in the mixer, we added a 90 degree phase shift. And the consequence of that was where the in-phase channel has a cosine residual frequency, the quadrature channel have, will have sine. And so right away, you can see something here that when the energy is in the in-phase channel, the quadrature channel is small. Let me highlight that. So when there's large amount of energy here, there's a small amount here, and vice versa. So when this goes to 0, this there's a large amount of energy there. And so just intuitively, it looks like there's always some signal there. And algebraically, we're going to see why, in fact, there, there's all the signal is still there. And so what goes on with the I and Q channels then is we, we have the coherent integration here, where Whatever comes in is coherently accumulated. And remember, coherently implies that if there's a phase change, we stay coherent with it. And so negatives will cancel positives. So it's a bad thing for us in that sense. And then we square and add. And then we get this so-called non-coherent integration. And it's non-coherent. That doesn't mean you don't understand it, even if maybe you're having some trouble understanding it. That's not what it means. Non-coherent means it doesn't stay coherent with the phase coming in. The phase can do whatever it likes. And we're still going to get a positive peak coming out here because of the squaring. 
So that's, that's what we're looking at, this non-coherent integration. So that's the, the basic block diagram. And I, I want to flip back to one of the slides that we saw in Module 4, where we did all that beautiful algebra. And you'll, I hope you'll remember this. And uh, we, we developed all these equations. And right in the middle here, there you'll see the i, the in phase, and the quadrature. And you'll remember we got the in phase by multiplying the, the mixer here by cosine. And we got the quadrature by multiplying the mixer by minus 2 sine. And that generated these two signals out of phase with each other. We got a cosine here and a sine there. And you did those equations in the video with me. Uh, so you should remember that. And so now if you look at that, let's look at the in phase. We had cosine of something. And we, we had an amplitude term of some magnitude, the data and the PRN code. The data and PRN code are just plus or minus ones in each case. And so we could represent all of that there simply by some uh, multiplier term d of t, where it's plus or minus 1 times some amplitude, and then cosine of some frequency omega, and, and that's all of that. So we can just write i as d of t times cosine omega t, and it's d sub k because it changes uh, with each chip of the PRN code and with each data bit. And then quadrature is just going to be the same thing times sine over omega t. And so, so now that we've seen that, we can leave the more complicated algebra behind and move on to our more abstract diagram. And now you'll recognize where the in phase and the quadrature come from. And, and then on the next slide, we're just going to pull those out and look at them individually and see why this all works out beyond just this idea of the, that the energy moves from here to here and back. We're going to look at why all the information is actually there. So we pull out i and q like that and expand those pictures. And just remember, d is just the PR encode and data with some amplitude. Omega is the residual frequency error. And we're, we're going to look at what happens, what's going to happen to the, the result of i squared plus q squared after the correlation. And now keep in mind, what is correlation? It's just a multiply by the locally generated copy of the PRN code. So it's just a, a multiplying by 1 or minus 1 at each sample, and then accumulating all of that. So anything that, ha so we can look at the i squared plus q squared pre-correlation and see what happens to that. And anything that happens to that will also happen to it post-correlation, because the correlation function is just this linear operation of multiply by plus or minus 1 and add up. So you can imagine if you had all those terms, if we wrote it out, it would be difficult to observe. But, but whatever, whatever scale factor happened would, would distribute across all those terms. So we're just going to look at i squared plus q squared here pre-correlation. That'll tell us, that'll show us why all the information is there. And the information we're looking for is this d term. Remember, this is the PRN code. It's buried in the noise when we get it at this stage. And when the whole reason we're correlating and integrating is to observe a correlation peak when we get our code delay correct. And so when we look at i squared plus q squared, we're hoping to get sums of all these plus or minus ones multiplied by copies of themselves, therefore sums of a whole lot of ones. And that's how the correlation peak builds up. And Thanks to this uh, cosine squared plus sine squared identity, that's exactly what happens. Because as you can see, i is d cos, q is d sine. So i squared plus q squared down here is d squared cos squared plus d squared sine squared. So it's really a simple thing. You get cos squared plus sine squared is 1. And so i squared plus q squared just gives you the d squared. And the d just is the, the PRN code. So if you follow through i through its correlator, q through its correlator, and then square them and add them, the magnitude, the expected magnitude of that when you've got the correlation right is just the square of what you would have had if you, if you had in-phase correlation and you did not have this residual frequency in the first place. So it's kind of a little magic trick that gives you back that d term even though you've got this residual frequency there.
So now we're going to look at post-correlation. So now, now we know that, that, that in the absence of noise, that the magnitude of that correlation peak would be the same as it was before. Now we're going to say, let's look at the presence of noise and what effect does the noise have. So to do this analysis, or to explain this analysis, what we've done is just picked an example where all the energy is in the I channel. And this is just to help us understand what's going on. As, as we just saw, the energy will move back and forth from the I channel to the Q channel as the residual frequency acts. So if we just pick an example where all the energy is in the I channel. And this, this is representative of all cases, but it's easier to see. So, so in the I channel, after correlation, you have a little correlation peak. In the Q, you've got nothing because the, the Q channel had no, in, no signal energy in it, so you just have noise. And there are three things that happen as a result of the noise. The mean noise, before squaring, the mean noise of I is 0. The mean noise of Q is 0. So the easiest thing to understand is number 2, is that the mean value of the noise after squaring, of course, is no longer 0. You take, you take the, the noise terms here, you square them. So they all be positive. All these terms that go positive, negative, positive. And here we've got negative, positive, negative. Square them, they'll be positive. And so the noise terms you get in i squared plus q squared are all going to be above 0. So the mean noise is above 0. So right away, that's, a, that's an effect of squaring. The second effect's not so obvious to see, uh, but if you wrote out the equation, you'd see it. I'm not going to do that because we don't have time. But the correlation magnitude in the presence of the noise changes a little bit because that previous equation we had, this the cos squared plus sine squared, there's, there's extra terms. There's cos plus noise and all of that squared, and sine plus noise and all of that squared. So you square it and add it, you get cross terms. And so the peak value, instead of being d, it's d plus some little error. So that changes by a little bit, which we don't have to worry about how much it changes that's taken care of in the, in the equations that we're not going to cover. But it's good to know that it does change by a little bit. And then finally, something that might not immediately occur to you, is that the standard deviation of the noise actually goes down. And if you look at what, if you just look at what happens to the noise, you'll see why. Look at i. It goes from some minus value to some positive value to some minus value to some positive value. And then a similar thing happening with q. So when we square it, this negative value is going to flip up to positive, And everything's going to change a little bit, but it's all positive. And so the standard deviation, although it's above 0, the amount that it changes is less than the amount that it changed when you had positive and negative. And that should be intuitive, because it doesn't have to go all the way to negative and back. It's all positive now. So three things happen because of the presence of the squaring and the noise. And all of those together result in something called squaring loss, which basically describes the difference between how high the peak is above the mean value of the noise compared to how high it would have been above 0 the mean value of the noise in the absence of this residual frequency that we're talking about. And we have to take that into account because our final SNR is exactly this. It's the peak value, the s, above the standard deviation of the noise about the new mean, the non-zero mean. That's what our final SNR is. So to derive our final SNR in our spreadsheets, we have to take into account this so-called squaring loss. So how do we do that? Well, there's a, a lot of mathematics to take care of that, which is in the, the textbook uh, for this section. And we won't go into that because it's, it's, it's very detailed. But it results in this curve, which shows you, given a certain coherent SNR before you did your squaring, before squaring, the squaring loss is going to, for any particular coherent SNR, suppose it was minus 5 db before you did your squaring, you're going to incur another 6 db of loss when you square. And if we go back to this picture, that's basically telling you if this peak was m m had a negative SNR, i.e. that this peak was lower than the noise, when you square the noise, the noise swamps it even more. You're even further below the noise after squaring. That's what this curve is telling you for these negative values.
of SNR here. So that quantifies it. And now you might think, well, that's, isn't that making things even worse? Well, yes, it is initially. However, once you've done the squaring, we can then correlate almost as long as we like, not, not literally as long as we like, but we can correlate for many, many tens of milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds, in fact, which we could not do with coherent integration. So, and this is a MATLAB uh, simulation where we generated I and Q samples, and we had residual frequency error, and we, and so we show that on the left here. We've got I and Q samples with an SNR of one. So this is this the the little correlation peak in here has the same magnitude as the standard deviation of the noise. And then going to the right, we do RSS operation, root sum of squares. And the result of that, this is a, a measured result after a lot of simulations, 0.88 squared. That's the uh, SNR after the squarings. And that's minus 1 dB. You see here we had 0 dB. So that things got worse because of squaring. However, we, we now made ourselves immune from the residual frequency error because of that co cos squared plus sine squared operation. So we're going to see the benefit of that. But before we, before we do that and look at the benefit, we're going to see what would have happened if we had done coherent integration here for a long time. Well, what would happen is, as we just showed, the little positive peaks would cancel with the negative peaks. And there's a small peak in here. You can't really see it. but when you this data is constructed in a MATLAB simulation, there was a positive peak of one. It's completely gone here. And the standard deviation, the SNR coming out of coherent integration after 100 milliseconds, there's no signal left at all. So we started with an SNR of, of one in magnitude ratio, and we get almost nothing after 100 milliseconds. And that corresponds to the kind of thing I showed you before with a positive peak and a zero peak and a negative peak all adding up. Here you've got a lots of positive, negative, positive, negative, all adding up over 100 milliseconds, all disappear. So coherent integration leads to no result after 100 milliseconds of integration. Non-coherent integration, we pay a tax up front of minus 1 dB in this case. Our, our little peak that's hiding in there is even smaller. But now we are immune from the change in frequency because of the cos squared, sine squared function that we, that we just looked at. Now when we integrate for 100 milliseconds, look what happens. This peak reappears. Okay, and this is not some artist impression. This is actual data that's run in the simulation. And so that's what happens. And so by paying the price of the squaring loss, making yourself immune from the slowly res varying residual frequency, you can then do this non-coherent integration for hundreds of milliseconds and get your peak back. And that's how we get high sensitivity, where with a very weak signal, we can eventually pull a correlation peak out. And then remember, the whole context of what, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to find this value tau, which is the delay we needed to find that peak. And that tells us what our pseudo range was. And that's how we do GPS navigation. So what is the non-coherent gain? Remember, we looked at coherent gain, and we worked out that the coherent gain after m samples was a value of m because the signal grew by m times and the noise grew by root m times because when you add up m samples of Gaussian noise, the standard deviation grows by root m. So the, the signal of the standard deviation of noise was m over root m. And then the SNR is the square of that. We, so you remember we had m coherent over root m coherent. That's the signal over the noise. And then the SNR is the square of that value. And so that just gave us m coherent. Well, with non-coherent integration, it's, it turns out to be exactly the same thing. And now if you, if you know something about noise statistics, you'll say, but hang on, this noise can't be Gaussian. And that's true. This noise is one of the few. Often noise, almost always noise is Gaussian uh, because it, it comes from many sources. The way we got this noise was by squaring Gaussian noise. So, so in the beginning, when we start doing the non-coherent integration, the noise is clearly not Gaussian because it's the square of Gaussian. So it's something non-Gaussian. 
However, there's something called the central limit theorem, which saves us. And the central limit theorem says that regardless of the distribution of any random process, if you add enough of these random processes together, they will tend towards a Gaussian distribution. And what we discover is after a few non-coherent integrations, like just as few as four or five, the noise tends to be very Gaussian distributed. And when we do tens of integrations or hundreds, then the noise becomes very Gaussian indeed. And so once again, we get this nice property that the sum of the noise grows as root m, the sum of the peaks just grows as m, the square of that gives us m squared over root m squared. And so the non-coherent gain is m, where m in this case is m and c, the number of non-coherent sums. So however many of these sums we do, the gain is just that number. So that's a nice result which we will use in the next video when we actually look at the spreadsheets for working out the result.